Hey, everybody. It's a plant-based business hour. I'm Elizabeth Alfano. Thanks for being with me today. February, it's the month of love. So I have to share with you my deep and long-lasting love for the mushroom. Yes, the mushroom, which I believe has properties that can truly save the world. Okay, I exaggerate a little bit, but it can solve many of the world's deep problems, which is why I want to bring on today the co-founder of Ecovative Design and the CEO of Atlas Food Company. And uh, I like to call him my mushroom, not my, our mushroom designer, our mushroom designer. I want to bring on Even Bayer uh, right here to the Plant-Based Business Hour. Even, thanks for being with me today. Thank you. And I'm happy to be uh, my mushroom designer because our product's called My Bacon. So you're right on the naming convention. Yeah. And there, and My Eats, right? So, yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, so we're going to we're going to get into that. First of all, I'll just do a super fast highlights about just how smart Eben is basically. That'll be the point of this. Uh you are maybe in your 30s. Like maybe, not even maybe. Like barely in your 30s. I'm in my th I'm in my 30s. Yeah. Okay, we'll give you that. Okay, fine. So you're in your 30s. You have like 10 patents. Um you're an engineer as I understand it by trade, but biology is what really moves your needle and of course your love of nature. Uh back in the day when you were still a student, you met Gavin McIntyre and the two of you founded Ecovative Design, basically built on the mushroom. So as much as I want to sing your praises, and I do, let's just start talking about mushrooms because that's my real true love. So um, please right. tell everybody what's so great about the mushroom. <laughs> mushrooms, uh, well, first of all, my, my love affair with the mushroom is with its roots, uh, what we think of as mycelium, which is not quite the root structure of mushrooms, but pretty close. It's what you, you find underground. Um, and I think mushrooms are like this super underappreciated uh, kingdom. You know, we have animals, we have plants, and we have fungi. And uh, we just haven't looked to kingdom fungi enough. And it can help us with plastics, and it can help us eat fewer animals. And those are, those are beautiful things in this day and age. Yes. Yeah, so I don't think people realize this. There's the mushroom that we see, and then there's the mycelium, the roots, the um, underpinnings, if you will. And what's so fascinating to me, I'm no biologist, but as I understand it, is that this network underneath the mushroom can communicate with each other. Do I have that right? Yeah, it's really, uh, it's kind of amazing when you see a mushroom on a tree or in, in the forest. I mean, it's only like one or 2% of the biomass that's there. So most of the action occurs underground. And um, yeah, mycelium acts as like the internet of the forest, uh, literally like moving a little iron or a little sugar from one tree to another, uh, doing lots of chemical signaling and basically like both communicating uh, between species and also recycling everything. So it's really like nature's recycling communication system. I mean, I just want people to wrap their minds around that, that mushrooms, let's say, over here to the left can communicate with the roots over here to the right and say, I need a little bit more, send it my way. Yeah. That's mind blowing to me. Um, and I love that you help people understand that it's not plant. And it's not animal. It's somewhere in between. Um, so in your opinion, we're going to talk about all that you do with Ecovative Design and addressing packaging and perhaps even materials and food, of course, with your uh, designing and working with, with mushrooms. Do you think we've even begun to tap into the power of the mushroom? Um, I really think that we're just scratching the surface uh, and we're just scratching the surface of Ecovative as well. Um, you know, again, until like the 1970s, mushrooms were taught as part of plant biology in most high school courses. So like, yeah. uh, like we really just haven't looked at this, this organism, this kingdom as a field and from medicine to psychology to materials and where we spend a lot of time is materials. There's just like huge promise there. And, and my belief is that um, natural technology like mycelium or like mushrooms is the kind of technology that, that we need now and is way more advanced than a lot of the stuff we've done with chemistry and metals in the past. So I don't want to belabor this, but um, why do you think that we haven't tapped into mushrooms as much as we could? I mean, the information has been there. Like you said, it was part of, you know, basically high school biology. So what, yeah. why aren't we with the program? <laughs> you know how, how humans are. We're kind of streaky. So, uh, you know, we've had like the, we had like the plastics revolution in the sixties. We've had the digital revolution. I think biology, the idea of using biology as technology, um, is just starting to come a abroad as a field. And only recently has it occurred to folks that you could look, you know, look to the humble mushroom as a form of biology. We can, we can really leverage. Um, you know, we've also like, when it comes to food, um, there are lots of different vegetables or fruit you might eat, right? 
But there's only one mushroom, 95% of all the mushrooms produced worldwide are a single mushroom, the white button mushroom. Now, yeah. you might say, hey, that's not right. I go to the supermarket, I get portobello mushrooms. It's like, well, that's actually just a white button mushroom. They grew longer. And so oh. sort of the industrial economy has just created like, of all the mushrooms you could eat, you only get one. It's kind of like if all the fruit you could eat, you could only have bananas and you can have like little bananas or big bananas. Yeah, this is a frustration point for me on many levels, because prior to mass industrialization, there were a gazillion chickens. Now I'm vegan. Don't panic, yeah. everybody. I'm not eating chicken. But they're just saying there were a gazillion varieties of chicken. And certainly that's true for the potato. Even now, if you go yeah. to Latin America, countries like Bolivia, let's say, where they don't have the industrialization that we do. I mean, they're advanced. I'm not yeah. saying they're not. But, you know, they've got black potatoes and, you know, all the 300 yeah. different types of potatoes. Um, and we've boiled ourselves down to like the Idaho potato and the sweet potato. Potato. And even that, how many people know about sweet yeah. potatoes? They're basically like sweet potato fries is their yeah, like yeah. exposure there. So um, I think that's a frustration point on many levels. Um, okay. I will say that I have portobello mushrooms. I also do a lot of oyster mushrooms, but that's, you know, that's You're special. As, <laughs> I'd like to think so. Um, and I love to eat them, just the mushrooms themselves. You know, I don't yeah. hide them away in things. And um, I just can make a big saute of mushrooms and lots of different kinds, or at least yeah. I think they're different kinds. Um, portobello, I guess, and the button and the, the oyster. And that's my dinner. I mean, I really, a right lot, of, lot of joy for me comes from mushrooms. But let's talk about some of the other properties for mushrooms that allows you to, again, I'll say design with it. So um, very spongy. Talk to me about the pressure that a mushroom can withstand. Uh, so mushrooms grow by uh, actually taking water and pushing it to the tip of the what's called a hyphae, which is a single unit of mycelium. And these are really small. They're like smaller than a single human hair. And so it's all these like billions of little microscopic fibers connecting, which make a mycelial mass. Um, and they can exert a credible pressure. So for instance, um, mushrooms have been known to like bust through pavement in places, right? Because they put all that pressure into the hyphal tip extension and they they can literally sh shatter asphalt. So th they're incredibly strong, but they can also be, as you point out, like very soft and supple and even form things like a, a leather-like material. Yeah, that's amazing to me. Um, some of the other properties, I'm just, you know, stealing this from his website, everybody. So ecovativedesign.com and atlasfood.co. We're going to get into food. Don't you worry. Um, mushrooms also repel water naturally. Yeah. Um, Much so like the, lo the lotus leaf. They have this like hydrophobic coating they make. It's a protein. And like if you get one of uh, our packaging parts, mushroom packaging uh, in the mail, which depending on what you order, you may instead of styrofoam, you could actually try this. You could take a little dropper and put little droplets of water on it. And it looks like a lotus leaf. It's like one of the more beautiful effects in the world. Yeah, that to me is just, again, we haven't even begun to harness all that is there. Um, and then there's all this airflow that happens between it. So it's incredibly strong. As you say, it's pushing up that pressure to the top, but then yep. it's got all this airflow to work with. So um, let's talk about Ecovative Design and, and all that you do really with the mushrooms. So you've taken on packaging pretty much head on. Talk to us about that. Yeah, and I guess uh, going back to your original question too, like why 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 mushrooms or myceliums? The way Ecovative got started 14 years ago was asking a really simple question, which is, what if we used mushrooms as materials, right. like not as yeah. food? Uh, and we created this field of mushroom material science, which was looking at fungi as materials, applying them to packaging, which I'll tell you about in just a second. But it's very interesting to me that I've come full circle to now starting a food company from a material standpoint in mycelium, which is like how mushrooms are known. Um, so, so with that coda, uh, we started uh, Ecovative to address styrofoam plastic pollution. And that's what we were trying to do with our packaging uh, and creating um, a replacement for styrofoam packaging you could compost in your garden. So the idea is create a nutrient uh, it's under mycocomposite. Yeah. Thank not you. Not a pollutant. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, this is, I want to show everyone visually on podcast. Yeah. I'm sorry you can't see this, but if you go to ecovativedesign.com, you will. For those of you with me on social media, this is the Ecovative Design website. And we're looking at what he, he grows materials. And we're looking at the composite here. Yeah. So this is the largest, that's a really large composite block. That's something you might slice to make like uh, an insulation panel or a wetland restoration raft. So something structural, you can float out into an estuary. It can survive for a couple of years, uh, but actually become part of the estuary and restore like a coastline. Uh, right now they use like plastic rafts for that, which is a really horrible way to restore an ecology. Um, and if you scroll down a little bit, I think you'll see some of the packaging parts down there. So you can see these sort of molded, molded shapes. Um, and what we've done in our packaging business is uh, we created this technology in 2009, 2010. Uh, we started manufacturing it in North America. Um, we realized it was just taking a long time and, and people all around the world were emailing us like, can I get this in my region? Can I get this in my country? And 
Um, rather than trying to build plants all around the world, we basically uh, partnered with entrepreneurs uh, in the UK, uh, in the EU, in Paradise, California, in New Zealand, um, and we're training them and we're training others around the world to set up these production sites. So there's a single uh, unified brand. Customers can go to mushroompackaging.com design packaging that uh, works like styrofoam, but you can compost in your garden. And then now there's a network of producers worldwide who are growing this product locally for those customers. Okay, so I'm looking at this picture of the Magical Mushroom Company, which, you know, rock on, that's a great name. And I see how the material has broken off and it shows me sort of the fiber, if you will, that is, am I looking at the mycelium joined with other natural materials? Yeah, you, you are. The, the recipe for mushroom packaging is really simple. It's a hemp herd, which is a byproduct from when you make hemp fiber. They take the fibers out of the stock. It's called decortication. Uh, and what's left is the like chunky stock material. Uh, it's often used as like an animal bedding or just composted. Um, we use that as the base material. And then the mycelial fibers you're seeing actually grow through and around the hemp herd and basically glue it together, like cement glues gravel together in concrete. Uh, and that's, uh, that's what holds the whole packaging together. The hemp kind of gives it its body. Uh, it's like 95% of the material and the mycelium forms the glue and also that soft white finish we were talking about mm -hmm. that really like in this case makes those glass bottles super happy in transport. Right. So for those of us who are hearing this on audio, so basically you have certain molds, let's say, you know, there's an alcohol company and they say, well, my bottle is, you know, so many inches tall and it's got this form. You create a mold through the mycelium and the other hemp products that grows to the shape of the mold that you've created, sort of sculpting there, if you will. And then that alcohol company has their packaging that can be 100% composted. That's right. That's right. And so we use these uh, molds we create in our factory. Um, you know, this is one of the nuances. So I've uh, often been very anti-plastic, but I should be clear, I'm anti-disposable plastic. Plastic's a wonderful invention. When it ends up in our oceans or our forests, that's when it really clogs up the Earth's ecology. Single-use packaging is like one of the primary causes of that. So we use these recyclable plastic molds in our factory. We use them hundreds of times. When they're done, they're recycled. They're melted down and turned back into molds. And we produce a packaging material that's a nutrient in your local environment, not a pollutant. So like if you leave our packaging in the forest, you've actually improved the forest ecology. That's the definition of the materials we should, we should use as humans, right? Leave it better than we find it. Yeah, a hundred percent and leave it smarter than we found it. So, you yeah. know, when you throw away plastic, you're really dumbing down the planet because that's just, yeah. A, yeah, not helping you out. So that is so cool. You've got really, I think maybe what Ecovative perhaps is the most known for, which is its packaging, but it doesn't stop there. I should have kept sharing the screen. You also <laughs> have replaced foam, not just for the packaging, but also in beauty care products and in backpacks and in gym shoes. So is that the same kind of mold product? process? Um, it, it's a, actually a totally different process. So while we started with mycelium, uh, we uh, basically uh, found another way of growing mycelium that produces a different type of material. And so I just reset my camera in the hopes I can show you this. But this is a mycelial foam and you can see it's super soft. It's super flexible. It's super pliable. Um, and the, the packaging is very low cost. It's got mostly ag waste, hemp waste in it, as I said. And so that when you break it open, like particles come out, it's meant to replace styrofoam. This is really a beautiful, high-performance material, um, and you can use this to replace the shoe you might, the foam you might find in a sneaker, uh, insulation foam or aerospace foam. Um, you can also compress this and make it into a really cool skin-like material. Uh, and this was the inspiration behind Atlas and the whole cut muscle meats we're now growing. Wow. So we're going to talk about food in a second. But so in one way, you have this very hard material um, showing the strength of mushrooms, which I'm kind of still amazed by. And then on the other hand, you have this yeah. really soft, pliable, bouncy, foamy yeah. thing. And it's still the a mushroom base and you're combining it with other products now to get it to be. Yeah. So the, actually. Yeah, so um, this is, I call this the forager secret. And the forager secret is that uh, mushrooms provide like all sorts of different materials. If you go out into the forest, you can find hard mushrooms, you can find leathery mushrooms, you can find the oyster mushroom, which is by the way, what we use at Atlas to make delicious meat-like materials. Um, and you can find like really strong uh, wood-like mushrooms. And what we do at Ecubative is uh, we use those for inspiration, but we literally work with mycelium. We say, 
Show us how you made that wood-like structure on the tree. We want to make a slab of wood-like mycelium. Show us how you make that really soft, spongy mycelium we saw on the tree. We want to just grow spongy mycelium, you know? Show us how you make that delicious part of the oyster mushroom that's actually the part you really love to eat. We just want to grow a big slab of that and turn it into bacon. And that's I, the forager's secret. I often wonder why we try to recreate so much that is already given to us in nature. Yeah. So much of yeah. the engineering is right there. Um, I, I, You remind me as if I know him personally, you remind me of Leonardo da Vinci <laughs> because he, he, you know, That's when I studied, <laughs> but you know, he was always following engineering yeah. and yeah. Um, science from nature. And that was his biggest yeah. inspiration for how water moved and things flowed and yeah. things turned and where to get power and all these great resources coming right from nature. Um, so very cool. Okay. So we've got the sponge like, and we've got the hard packaging, uh, but of course we have food. So let's talk about Atlas food. So um, I want to show a picture here of my bacon, which has come to me, and I'm so very excited. I had to travel this week, so I haven't tried it yet. But look, folks, look what is coming. Let me get rid of that banner out of your way. Oh, my God. So here is um, my bacon. It's from uh, Atlas Foods, so of course, even. And we're talking about mushrooms or bacon made from mushrooms, which for me makes a lot of sense because there's so much umami, obviously, in the mushroom taste. Um, and I just can't wait to get into this. This is just so delicious. And I really want to know from you, when can we all get this in the stores? Well, the, the good news is this product is on store shelves. So we really believe in, um, you know, not just talking about what we're doing, but making things available. Uh, the bad news is it's only in one store right now. It's in the yes. Honest Way Co-op in Albany, New York. Um, they'll probably kill me for saying this on the show because they've been just overwhelmed with people going to the store. So if, if you go, please be nice to the folks there. Um, but we're, <laughs> we're, we're building capacity. It, it'll be in more co-ops in North uh, New York later this year. And we're going to wide distribution next year. So it, it's coming. We're building as fast as we can. Okay, so a conversation that happens a lot when we talk about plant-based foods is, sure, there's a, a pea protein source, or there's a mushroom source, but then what else are you doing to it? So I'm curious, what are the other ingredients for your My Bacon? Yeah, this wasn't really important to us under My Bacon and the My Eats brand, is we wanted to create like the, the epitome of what would be possible with this as a mycelium super ingredient. Uh, and so the only other ingredients, there's only six of them. We've got coconut fat, which replaces the pork fat, right? That's uh, and just mycelium itself, which is about 85% of the whole product. So the mushroom mycelium provides the texture, provides that umami flavor you mentioned. That's what makes it taste meat-like. Mm -hmm. And most of the nutritional value comes from that. Um, coconut fat's what, you know, helps it fry and crisp up. Fat's pretty important for most flavor systems. Salt, sugar, uh, liquid smoke, and then a few natural flavorings to give it that that bacon smell when you cook it. That's it. That's, that's the it. whole ingredient label. Yeah. yeah. So that's wonderful. So, um, and, and for the mushrooms themselves, is there much processing that goes on there, or are you using? How, tell this me is, about that. This is the beauty of uh, using mycelium. Is we grow whole cloth, this basically a mushroom pork belly. It's like the size of a pork belly. We made it the same geometry of a pork belly. Uh, we actually uh, rented an old smokehouse, old pork smokehouse in Albany. You can run these pork bellies right through the old uh, industrial pork pork cutters. And so you slice it, uh, you squish it, you add the flavors, you boil it in the salt water or whatever, and that's it. Uh, you know, and then we put, be oh, beet juice. I'm sorry. The beet juice is included as a colorant. So that's the final ingredient. Um, and that's, the, that's the product in the package. I mean, you can make it in a kitchen. We made it in a kitchen at Ecovative for the first year. So. Wow. So again, you're just letting mushrooms do their thing. You're just kind of working with the mushroom and taking that, which it has to give. I'm going to share my screen again, because I want to show you, you were talking about growing the mushrooms in the slabs that, um, yeah. 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 Let me. Get, okay. So here we are. Oh yeah. Perfect. Uh, yeah. So show us for those listening on audio. You've got these huge, thick, maybe three, four, or five inches thick, long slabs of basically just the mycelium, I believe, that's grown from the mushrooms, sort of in a structured way. Tell us what we're looking at. Yeah, so they almost look like fluffy clouds. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, I, our, part of our team wanted to call the product Cloud Nine for that reason, uh, <laughs> which I, I, I love. I like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but the, this is the idea, again, of working with nature in that our, my belief is that nature already created the best plant-based steak. She already created the best plant-based pork. 
Um, they're these mushrooms. And unfortunately in nature, um, they come in the form of mushrooms. They take weeks to grow. Uh, they're very, often very hard to get. They're often very expensive. Um, and they don't like literally the geometry doesn't lend itself to making a whole cut meat like bacon. Um, so we get the mushroom, the mycelium to make the same sorts of structures, if you will. So those fibers aligning the same way to be meat like, but we make it in a geometry that's industrializable. So we grow these white fluffy slabs, if you will, we're growing these slabs in the form of pork belly sizes so we can put it into the pork infrastructure. Um, and then you basically have like uh, industrialized scalable mushroom meat. And that's what we're all about. Wow. And so then you just cut it from there that that what you need. So I'm, here's a close up everybody of how it looks yeah. from a side view of all the mycelium growing together. And we talked about this before. So it, it repels water. It's got some airflow in there. It's very strong yep. and it's also very tasty, which is so cool. Um, and it's it's really important that we, we do harvest it whole cloth because again, this is like, uh, you know, you can get a mincemeat, like you can get an Impossible Burger, Beyond Burger, but they're all ground meat. 80% of the meat market is whole cuts of meat. Uh, what makes whole cut of meat so like delicious and appealing to people? It's the fact it grew into the form of a whole cut. Like on a micron mm -hmm. scale, those muscle fibers grew. So by letting the mushroom mycelium self-assemble on the same scale, so the mycelial fibers are very similar in size to meat fibers, you're taking advantage of that and getting a meat-like material. And then all you're doing is like with a kitchen knife, slicing it up like a slab of meat. Like that's the secret is let, let nature do the, the heavy lifting. And we're just like guiding her along. Yeah, that is just so awesome that uh, basically what you're talking about right now, we're looking at bacon, but soon we're looking at steak, right? <laughs> yeah, we'll get to steak. But we're, it turns out there's an incredible amount of bacon consumed worldwide. So it might take yes. us a while. <laughs> yes. Are, are you are you finding that you're already getting requests around the world for my bacon? Oh, yeah. We're uh, it's really um, I mean, our challenge, we've, we've upped our capacity timeline and capacity plan twice. I mean, we're like, we can't go any faster than we're going. Uh, wow. Good problem. We're happy. Yeah, but, good problem. Uh, so yeah. At Last Foods is hiring, I'm guessing, um, everybody. <laughs> yeah, uh, we have jobs posted. So I'd actually make a, pl a plea. If anyone's in the sector, please come online and apply. You can work remotely. Um, like we'd love to get the best food talent in the world uh, in Atlas. I should connect you with Passion Placements. They're wonderful for connecting those mission aligned folks who, um, yeah, want to. Yeah, Got I'll it. connect you guys later. Uh, and anybody else looking for a job in the plant-based world, passionplacement.com. It's, it's great to feel that all of your energies go towards, you know, daily, go towards the things you believe in. Um, okay, so steak might be coming. For now, you're focused on bacon. To do the bacon, you didn't really talk about scaffolding scaffolding too much or am I m misunderstanding? Is is that sort of already the scaffolding to grow those mycelium so thick? Yeah. So actually this, the mycelium itself kind of forms its own scaffold. So if you think about how that pillow grows, um, every, let's say minute, there's a micron level uh, layer of mycelium fibers that gets deposited. Right. And so it's oh. almost like a 3d printer, a biological 3d printer that's going, you know, growing all these layers. And then we influence how the layers form, which is how we influence the texture and the flavors. Um, and so it scaffolds itself. Um, we're doing this as a 100% mycelium or plant-based bacon, right? So it's just mycelium and coconut oil are the primary ingredients. You can actually seed uh, animal cells into this. There's something called cell-based agriculture where you literally sure. grow cells in a lab. Sure. Um, the big problem with those is they tend to grow on flat sheets or in liquid bioreactors. So how do you get like, how do you get an animal cell to grow into a muscle? It needs to be scaffolded into something that looks like muscle. So we've also been testing in for a longer term uh a plan, we're looking at seeding it with animal cells to grow as a scaffolding. And we're providing that as a scaffolding material to the cell ag industry, which is much more at a lab scale basis. But that's a longer term uh, angle for it. Yeah, it's a much longer term project. But again, that capacity to grow nature and the cells through this use of scaffolding and um, I guess mushrooms would be intertwined in that, right? The yeah. mycelium scaffolding would be what would allow those cells it's to grow. One of the big issues is actually if you use a scaffolding material, like how do you make it edible? And so the product is edible. And in fact, I think in that in that theory, you'd have like a hybrid material where um, the mycelium was actually providing some of the flavor and structure and the, the cells that it propagated might be providing like that chicken, that actual chicken flavor, that actual pork flavor. So I, I hopefully can't... make those products more cost effective. Yes, right. Yeah, as well. And scalable, right? And which is yeah. what would make it cost effective is if it were scalable. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't wait for that product. And not even because I want chicken, because I don't. I mean, I like my vegetables. I like my mushrooms. But yeah. I want the innovation to be there. Because from where I sit, when I look at the food supply system, you know, over the hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years, food has been um, 
innovated upon again and again. And it seems that we've run out of innovation with animal agriculture. And the yeah. next logical step to be resource efficient is to get rid of the animal. And so people consider it like, oh my God, you're introducing tech into my food. And I'm always saying, no, tech was always there building on the building blocks yeah. of nature. But even so tech has been around in our food forever. You look at the hybrids of wheats that we grow now. We talked about you know, only having mushrooms and not having the other kinds yeah. because we're hybriding all these mushrooms to grow fast faster and powerful. Tech has been in your food for a whole heck of a long time. And it's not bad. It just depends on what you do with it. It could be nefarious. It sure could be, you know, yeah. Dr. Evil or from, you know, one of a it's movie. All about, or, it's yeah. all about intention. Of course it is. Of course it yeah. is. So tech isn't new and it isn't bad, but it's kind of run its course for animal agriculture from where I sit. I know sometimes people say, oh, but you know, there's, there's new kinds of, you know, certified humane this and that. Sorry, not for me. I think it's kind of run its course so the next step in innovation, and and you know we all need it so badly as a planet as we go from 7.6 billion people to 9.8 billion people, but you're not getting more land and you're not getting more water. Yeah. So you're gonna have to do the next step in innovation and this is it. So I really can't wait for that kind of product to come to market. Um, we haven't talked about it, but usually when I'm talking to anyone about microbes and fungi, there's some conversation around fermentation. And I think um, the growing of your mycelium pillows, if we can call it that, is, would it be considered solid state fermentation? Help me out yeah. with that. Yeah, you got that right on the nose. So 99% okay. um, uh, of the world does what's called liquid fermentation, right? Which is growing bacteria or yeast in tanks. It's how you make beer. So it's like the original right. liquid fermentation. Um, and you get what's called a small molecule. So 1972, the, the re bio revolution started with making insulin in these sy systems. That was after beer, but still very important. Um, and now we're like brewing like the heme molecule, which is what like makes the impossible burger taste like blood. Um, what we're doing is called solid state fermentation. So rather than being in a liquid, it's literally a solid media. And so in the case of Atlas Foods, uh, we're using wood chips as that solid media. And then the mushroom belly is forming above the wood chip surface, right? So when we harvest that, we're actually removing this pure mushroom material from the top and we're left with basically composted or digested wood chips as a, as a byproduct, which is a compostable waste stream. I just, it's fascinating. It, it's fascinating. Yeah. Um, and I just want to riff off of something that you said, you talked about um, precision fermentation and liquid fermentation for insulin. So one more note, folks, uh, you already have this kind of technology in your food system. I mean, if you're taking insulin, we no longer yeah. factory farm, thank God, pigs for insulin because it's not safe and there's lots of traces of yeah. dirt and feces and the rest of it. We do um, precision fermentation and the pharmaceutical work, uh, companies got on that a long time ago. They yeah. saw how more efficient that would be. So, you know, it's it's not new and it's not bad. Um, I, I was so just on that tech point too. You know, I, I should note, I, I, I grew up farming in central Vermont. So I raised pigs, I killed pigs, I raised chickens. I had to do all of that. Small crop farm, right? So like yeah. 50 pigs, three chickens. Like we really like, yeah. it was a real farm. It was a real working farm. Um, I didn't like doing that, but I'll tell you like the broiler chicken, like the strain of chicken that they grow industrially, like they can't even walk around, oh, right? God, like the things we've done to these animal genetics um, are not improvements to what they were. Um, in terms of the flavor health experience you get or the life of those animals, it's really horrible. And the strain of uh, mycelium we're using, um, we got that from a forest in upstate New York um, a couple of years ago. It's yeah. like fr fresh from the forest and does exactly what we need. And again, we're not like, we're giving it like gentle pushes along its growth cycle. So this is, I would argue, less technology than you currently have in a chicken uh, at the moment. Mm -hmm. I love that you say that, uh, how much technology is already in a chicken for nefarious reasons. I mean, not good for the chicken, but not good for your health yeah. either. Not yeah. doing you any favors there, my friends. So, um, okay. Well, we talked about, you know, how better this is for the environment, you know, animal agriculture being a detriment to the environment. Um, let's talk about some of the other resources or um, efficiencies that this affords. So um, I think what you were saying on your website that I read, if it takes 12 acres of land to grow animal meat, you can do the same in one acre. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It's actually uh, it's probably significantly better than that. That's a, just a one-to-one -one comparison to the surface area of a farm to our farms, which are vertical farms that have at least uh, 12 layers. Um, it also takes like uh, multiple months to like grow a pig like six months. Um, and we grow this ingredient in just 10 days. Uh, and yeah. so 
less CO2, less water usage, less land usage, no light usage, um, just overall less resource utilization. So it's really a very powerful way to change change your footprint while still having something delicious. Yeah, and I think sometimes a lot of people forget that it's not just the animals that we grow. So, you know, we have trees which pull carbon from the air, which is so wonderful, we need to do that. We cut down these trees to grow grains. All those grains have fiber, they have protein. Do we give that food to people? No, we give those food to animals. Then we give them time, then we give them land, then we give them water, then we give them more grains. Not enough, still don't have any food. Oh my gosh, cut down more trees, grow more grains. Giving that food to people? No, we're still giving it to animals. So, um, you know, you're saving a lot in so many ways yeah. here just by the vertical farming of mushrooms, mushrooms, mushrooms. Um, okay, so... Everybody has your marching orders. If you are in New York, you can run to the one store that has my bacon. Don't actually don't do that, please. <laughs> do We're gonna that. get okay. kicked out of the store. It sells out <laughs> in like 20 minutes right now. <laughs> so can you do direct to consumer? Are you doing that for anybody? Can they order we, it from we will. your website? We will. Yeah. We, will. we will be doing that this year. Um, we're building, uh, just to give you a sense of our scale up, um, our goal is to get to 100 million pounds of a production over the next five years. Um, we're right at the 100,000 pounds of annual production mark right now. Um, that's a 10x scale up from where we were a year ago. We were at 1,000 pounds or 10,000 pounds roughly a year ago. And we were at uh, 100 pounds a year before. So we're on this very tight knee of a scaling cool. curve right now. And yeah. we're um, we're really pushing that as hard as we can. Yeah, it's just so awesome. Um, well, okay, so I can talk about the mushroom all day long, which is why I want to move away from food and back into materials. As you say on your website, you grow materials. How cool is that? Are we going to see mushroom leather? Talk to me about the possibility of that because the um, alternative materials leather market is something like $90 billion they're predicting by 2025. So do you see yourself yeah. working with mushroom leather? Um so I'll tell you a little bit about that market. I will just say as a preface, um, I really uh, can tell you more about that in two weeks. Uh, and we'll, oh. but I won't I, I won't say a lot about it today. <laughs> Ooh, gosh darn, you'll have to come back. Okay, well, I, tell, I, tell me what you can. I, 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 will, I will tell you what I can, which is uh, three years ago, we created one of the best mycelium leathers in the world. Uh, we initially licensed this to a technology a company called Bolt Threads. It's being produced under license uh, with the brand name Milo. Um, and I think mycelium is an excellent choice for replacing animal skin because, again, you grow this whole material. Uh, and it was our work in creating that uh, that platform and that first technology that led us to spin out Atlas Food Co. Uh, so it was the idea of like, hey, if we can do skin for an animal, like maybe we can do muscle meat uh, and got us really excited about that space. I don't think I realized you were behind Bolt. I'm over the moon about that. I, I guess now that I'm thinking about it, Gavin is associated with Bolt as well, right? Or maybe I have this No, ga no Gavin's a co-founder co of Ecovative. But I mean, well, we I are, that. Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, in general, I mean, we've worked closely with them. Gavin worked closely with the team. And in general, um, that Bolt is a licensee of our technology. They've gone and done their own beautiful things with the material. So what they're showing today is that them building on what we provided for them. Yeah. Um, but I would say we, we really do try and partner in this space. Uh, we realize that... Um, we can't do everything ourselves and we actually don't want to be a hindrance to the community. So um, at the smallest level, we sell something called uh, GIY kits, uh, grow.bio. So you can go get one of these kits. It's like dehydrated mushroom materials for 10 bucks or 15 bucks, put water in, it in your kitchen. Uh, you could start growing mycelium materials and it gives you a license to, to make up to a ton at a time. If you somehow make more than a ton of materials and sell them and you need more, go buy another kit. Um, we don't need to hear from you. Um, and then on packaging, we've, we've licensed it broadly, as I mentioned. So producers around the world can set up their own factory in their own ecosystem. We'll train you, uh, but then you go to town and build a business. And so um, if you hear about mycelium materials, we're probably uh, involved in some way and try to be involved in a positive manner. Okay, so if you thought that the world was not going to make it, now hopefully because we've had this interview with Eben, you realize that there's hope at the end of the tunnel because <laughs> someone is trying to solve the world's problems. Um, I'll say that your approach to food has been the same, if I'm understanding it correctly. So Atlas Food Co. does work with other food companies. Then you have your own brand, My Bacon, My Eats, et cetera. But you, Atlas is really intended to be a B2B. Isn't that right? Yeah, I think one of our core ideas in starting Atlas, again, is we started outside in, which we said, hey, if we look at the meat market, 80% of the value, 80% of the volume is in whole cuts. Um, we want to make an impact on animal agriculture. Like, we got to address this, right? Like, right. the ground meat, mincemeat side actually isn't going to do it. Um, and yeah. so 
uh, that was the focus. And then when we said that, we realized, well, then everyone's got this problem. No one seems to have cracked the code on how to make a whole cut of anything. Fish, right. bacon, steak, no one has anything. Mushrooms are the answer. It's the same idea. Do we want to only build our own brand and limit that? No, we want to bring that non-exclusively to as many partners as possible. Use that partner demand to drive us to scale as fast as possible and move move the spaceship Earth, the you know spaceship we're on, as much as possible in the right direction. And so that is the, the philosophy behind the B2B though we will offer it direct to consumers as well, just as a smaller portion of the volume. Preach. Yeah. Okay. So mushrooms are the answer. Uh, I'm not even going to summarize that because it was so great and we all get what he's saying. Yeah. We have to move this spaceship earth to a better spot um, for all of us. So, so very cool. Well, let me ask you a couple of personal questions because as I understand it, you said you grew up on a farm um, in upstate New York and um, now you're living off the grid. Tell me what that's like and what that is exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so just again, I grew up in a very small farming community. Um, not a lot of people there. Went to college in Troy, New York, which is like I thought was a giant city. It turns out it's a small city, uh, but it was just like really like hard for me. And uh, I mean, I just longed to be back in the forest, be back on the farm. Uh, I wanted to get off the farm at the time. I couldn't wait to get away from the animals. Uh, when mm -hmm. I got to school, I realized like animals are the greatest technology in the world. Mm -hmm. Trees are the most advanced technology on yeah. Spaceship Earth. Like I don't want to learn about jet engines. I want to learn about biology. And so um, as soon as I could, my, my partner, my wife and I got some land outside of Troy. Uh, we built a one room cabin, timber frame cabin ourselves, um, lived in that off grid for our first year, like water freezing on our like, you know, little bedside on the ground, wood stove, no toilet. There's still no toilet in it. Um, and then I've slowly worked our way up to having like a real house. It's still off grid solar panels. I built a little hydroelectric system. Um, I, I got a, a Tesla Model S that was destroyed. I got the battery pack out of that. So all the blinky lights behind me are part of that battery system. And uh, <laughs> it's all about like living your values, you know, not just like talking about them at work, but like this is this is the value I want to live. Yeah, that's so awesome. Um, I have dreams of living off the grid. I, I will use your example as a beacon in my life. My great grandfather built a, so I, I'm from Illinois. In Northern Illinois, there's this chain of man-made lakes and there was one island that wasn't very big. And my great grandfather wrote, so first of all, there's only dirt roads from Chicago to that. But then once you got to this place where the lakes were, he would row a cement mixer and take it over. And he built a two room house in 1940 on top of the hill. There's no sidewalks. There's no cars. There's no bridge to this Love island. It. There's nothing. And so we do have neighbors. There are about 20 houses there, but it's just 20 houses. And we're in the middle of nowhere on this island. And I, I spend That's three months awesome. out of a year there and I love it. So um, I'm actually not a people person. So you are my <laughs> idol here. Uh, okay. Well, let me ask you this, because I mentioned that you remind me of um, Leonardo da Vinci, but I'll also say there's lots of Buckminster Fuller in you. So <laughs> if he were alive today, what would he say about all this? Yeah, I mean, I, I Buckminster Bucky is totally a, 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 an idol of mine, and I think you know we all gotta know we really do stand on the shoulders of giants and, and need to honor mm -hmm. people who come before. Um, I think he'd be kind of freaking out though. I mean, he talked a lot about like. Take, you know, this idea of spaceship Earth comes from Buckminster Fuller. It's this idea that like, we want to go to space, we want to colonize Mars, like, we're already on a freaking spaceship. We're on this rock that's traveling <laughs> through space at millions of miles per hour. Yeah. It's got this self sustaining <laughs> ecology, like it makes yeah. oxygen, it makes shelter for you, like, take care of that. We are the pilots of spaceship Earth. And so yeah. like, I really think like what's happening now around biology is technology, he would be like really in favor of. And I think the rest of the sort of uh, let's just call it ongoing systemic harm to the planet, which is caused through human systems. He would be very saddened by, but um, I, he was always an optimist. I think he, I think he'd see hope in where we're headed, and particularly in using biology or nature to solve our challenges. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think he would be all about solving, and his um, antidote to his despair, which he would certainly feel looking around him, would be to solve and create and solve and create. Um, well, okay. With that in mind, a couple closing questions from where you sit. I used to ask this question for 10 years, but now the plant-based world and innovation is moving so quickly. I ask it for three to five years from where you sit, where do you think we'll be three to five years from now? Uh, on the plant-based meat side? Uh, yeah, on, I, on, on the plant-based meat and material side, I'll say. Okay. Um, so I think uh, my hope is that we will be in a position where, um, uh, particularly me, I'm not telling you it's in one retail location, it's available nationwide. Because I, I, I think... 
for a lot of these innovations, um, I'm proud of my company. We've scaled, as I mentioned, packaging is available around the world in three continents. We have a lot more work to do, but like it's a real thing. We're scaling it. I think there's been a lot of false promises and false hope put out there in the material mm -hmm. space, particularly around these technologies. And um, you know, that's to be forgiven. Like this is really hard stuff. Like humans have never used biology in this way before. Um, but also, like we got to make it work. Like the planet can't wait, people can't wait, and people are going to lose faith. And so, uh, my hope is whether it's it's my stuff or other stuff in the field that it's just prevalent and it's on every street corner. Because I, I firmly believe if we use biological materials um, as our materials instead of synthetics, like that right there just makes the world a better place. And then you you worry a little bit about less about what people are doing with it, right? So again, the idea that the packaging you, you if you don't put it in the recycling, it ends up on your lawn. It's not a problem. It's a nutrient. Um, if you eat so much of our bacon every day that you get all your daily fiber from it, which you can do, um, you know, it's not an environmental catastrophe. You should probably <laughs> diversify your diet, but like, you're, it's okay. You're going to be okay. And the pigs will be okay. So yeah. I think just like total prevalence of this stuff would be uh, what I want to see. That's what I want to see as well. And I don't think that'll happen in three to five years, but I think the rate of change is shocking and the dominoes are going to fall really fast. And so when the transition comes, it's going to come really quickly. And I think we are going to see what you're talking about, I'll say by 2040, um, in in a majority sense, like more than 50% yeah. of packaging and food is in yeah. this space. It's, it's so very exciting. Um, from your uh, genius, innovative mind, what product would you like to see out there that you're not seeing? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, hmm. So, uh, you know, the product I'd really like to see out there um, is electric autonomous cars, which again oh. is another one where there's been some real uh, promises made around it, um, but it, it hasn't happened. And I say this as a rail fan. So I'm a huge train fan. I'd love for there just to be train transportation across our country. Um, who's accepted that won't happen. And um, autonomous vehicles actually have the power to unlock a lot of society in a way that would be really helpful, I think, for people. Um, and it's, you know, that's the product I'd like to see. I'd like to see plant-based wool. And <laughs> uh, yes, I say to my boyfriend every year, this is the year for my birthday that you're going to get me that backpack with the rockets on the back, right? So that's what I've always wanted. I just want that one is of those. Coming. I want that so badly. I really There's want it. There's some guy in L.A. that's been like jetting around by the airport. <laughs> I love um, him. Yeah, we, I know. <laughs> we have a fur. I'll send you some fur. We accidentally made fur when we were trying to grow some food, and uh, it really looks like fur. So. <laughs> I, I will tell me if it's close. Yeah. I, if you are willing to send that to me, I would. Yes, I say yes to that. Absolutely. My, my okay. Team's probably going to message me after this. <laughs> uh, a couple more quickie questions. Um, still on the sort of philosophical side. So much has changed, and you are a, an agent of change. Thank you for all the work you do. You are making so many things possible. What do you wish you knew ten years ago or five years ago that you know now? Um. So I think one of the things I've learned, uh, I've been at this for quite a while now. So this is, I'm in year 14 for Ecovative. It's year two for Atlas. Um, both companies are, are linked though, obviously. Sure. Um, and, you know, I think uh, I've learned it the hard way, but uh, A, like journeys are not straight lines. In fact, I think mm -hmm. some of the most successful and impactful journeys you go on um, are very, very winding. Um, and there are many like failure points along the way that just feel like the end that are actually a new beginning. And you have to you have to embrace those moments and build upon them. And um, it's good to have those happen because that's what gives you experience and that's what gives you the toolkits to actually uh, do incredible things. Uh, and so if I was to go back in time, I'd, I'd tell myself that. And if someone listening is experiencing a moment like that in, in your life right now, um, as many of us have in this challenging year, I, I tell you the same thing, which is uh, these are the things that make you stronger and you will build better from them. So to not be deterred, well, you sort of snuck it on my next question, which is if you're having a bad day, is there a phrase that you repeat to, sell your, to yourself to get yourself back in the game? Um, I, I do. I, I, uh, um, my wife, Nicole, doesn't like this phrase because it can go either way, but this too shall pass um, mm -hmm. is a powerful phrase. Um, and then the other thing I, I do do, and I was recently um, reminded of this uh, very personally at the incubative level is... Um, you know, we're not here on Spaceship Earth very long. Uh, right. It feels like we're here forever, right? But you can go at any moment and we all go eventually. Um, and whatever you're facing in the moment, um, 
typically it's 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 more manageable than that reality. And you know, while you're here, you should do your best to to make the most of it. Uh, have joy for yourself. Bring joy to others, and try to leave the world a little better than you found it. And for me, you can get to that point. It makes everything else sort of drop away, and you can get focused again. Yes, I love that. Um, I for me to do that, I usually have to switch gears and go, like go jogging. And then I can switch my <laughs> yes. mindset. Like if I leave that computer or that room or that conversation, or I switch up my mindset, go for a jog, and then I remember all of these wonderful things. Okay, so last question for you before I let you go back to, to solving the world's problems. Uh, you're running around super fast. You don't have time for lunch. What is your go-to snack? Uh, peanut butter. I eat a Yay, lot of peanut butter. Yay, <laughs> peanut butter too. Just alone or? Uh, yeah, just peanut or almond butter, but yeah. <laughs> I so, probably derive half, honestly, like half of my calories from peanut butter. <laughs> I love that. Um, one of my favorite things is peanut butter and raisins. So I eat a lot of that. It's a good one. Okay. As we exit here, um, want to hear a joke? Of course. A mushroom walks into a bar mm -hmm. and the bartender says, hey, we don't serve your kind here. And the mushroom says, but why? I'm a fun guy. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you yes. for that. <laughs> it might come in handy, given your line of work. You might need to pull that out of your hat at some point. Um, yeah, <laughs> I got to laugh out of you. That's wonderful. Um, even don't go anywhere. You stay put. I want to thank you for all that you do. Thank you for being here with me. Everybody go to um, ecovative.com. EcovativeDesign.com. EcovativeDesign.com and uh, AtlasFood.co and see if you can start getting yourself some bacon. Maybe it's going to come out to more places than just New York. Stay up on everything that he does. You can find him on LinkedIn. You can find me on LinkedIn. And um, on behalf of everybody listening and watching today, I'm so grateful for all that you do. So thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Stay put to everybody else on Facebook. I will see you in a couple days. And uh, thanks for being vegan, everybody. Bye.